Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. I have with me Nathan Patterson. Hello, everybody. Younger brother of Robert Patterson, famous actor. No. Oh. <laughs> Today on God is Open, we are going to be talking about the Duffy Slick debate. We will both watch both debates, and uh, this is kind of just like a post-op. We're, we're still in Denver. We're, we're, we're fresh off the debate. This is just our initial impressions about how each debate went. We'll just talk about kind of this, the concepts that they talked about, but first we're going to talk about what they did right and what there could have been slight improvements on. And one thing I'd like to stress here is that when you are in a debate, when you are the person debating, a lot of stuff in hindsight, you know, you miss. When you're up there on stage, when you're doing the debate in person as, as yourself, you know, it's easy to criticize after the fact. So any of our criticisms are not meant to be like, well, he, he was wrong, he should have done this better. These are suggested improvements for future growth in these types of debates. Things that we need to be thinking about when we talk about this. Any input? Uh, I totally agree. Um, like I said, just from our own observations, from what we saw uh, from both parties, uh, positives, negatives, um, and just we're just here just to discuss the debate. You can all listen to it yourself online. Uh, both parts are up. They recorded. There's video, audio. Uh, plenty of Q&A questions at the end of it, and uh, yeah, just uh, go to godisopen.com uh, for more information to learn more about open theism, or come join us at God is Open, uh, open Facebook group in order to uh, participate in the discussion. So. so look at this. We got a third guest today. Oh. This is our friend, Joseph Sabo. He rode down with me. He traveled with me to Colorado for this debate. And Joseph, would you like to give any initial thoughts on the debate? Very good. Very interesting. So let's talk about the first debate. The first debate was titled, Is the God of the Open Theism the God of the Bible? You know, something along those yes. lines. And so this was where Will Duffy, I think he designed this one to be more of the biblical, hard-hitting uh, debate on the Bible, where he, he focuses on the Bible, he talks about the Bible, he wants to talk about the scriptures in the Bible. Whereas the second debate was more focused on is God of Calvinism, is, is he loving? And you, you see a little bit of a distinctive between the two formats yes. of the debate. Will Duffy is heavy on the Bible in the first, not so heavy in the second. Matt Slick was not so heavy on the Bible in the first, a little bit heavier in the second because he tried to change that debate to be about predestination. Yes. His idea was, if I could prove predestination, then I proved God is loving. So uh, that, that was kind of yeah. his idea. He saves sinners, and that's how you know he's loving, because he actually saved us. Yeah. Okay. So, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So initial thoughts on the debate. What do you think Will Duffy did correct? I thought his opening statement was a very good presentation of open theism, in, in which he showed that open theism is indeed scriptural. Um, we're not coming at the Bible with a presupposition like Calvinism is where you have to apply a ton of nonsensical metaphysics and philosophical jargon in order to explain what is God saying and what God is not saying. Whereas open theism, the plain meaning of scripture with basic reading intuition and language skills, you can see um, God speaking to his people and we're not trying to say those are figures of speech, which you'll hear a lot in the debate, or just anthropomorphism with no actual solid, tangible answer after that. Yeah, I think Will Duffy did really well crafting his opening statement for each debate. He had a lot of time to think about this and plan it, and he's the one who initiated this debate with Matt Slick. So he, he probably had all this planned, what he wanted to stress in each of these debates. Where, where he might have uh, been taken aback just a little bit, especially in the second debate during the cross-examination, where Matt Slick was controlling the debate. Matt Slick wanted to talk about what he wanted to talk about, and Will Duffy was unprepared for that, and it kind of showed. I got a text message from a friend during that time saying, oh, look at this, uh, Will Duffy's getting slaughtered here. <laughs> but slaughtered, might, it might be over-exaggeration. There's a lot of people who are saying that Will definitely handled it very well, how he did. His his demeanor was came off very fluid. He came off as knowledgeable, especially in the first debate. When Meslick wanted to talk about his predestination, I don't think he came off as knowledgeable. No, no, whatsoever. Um, the thing was, too, that I noticed with Will, especially during cross-examination, was very solid, very, th very firm. He had Matt Slick affirming things that most Calvinists would not 
hear him talk say like that like we'll get to eventually about god actually being in time um and god having a uh, temporal reality instead of outside time as most calvinists believe and uh, that was really really striking in there and uh yeah it, i think will did a great job there and, and like you'd mentioned before matt slick wanted to talk about election and predestination and will was i don't think was prepared for that because almost like matt slick was changing the debate all of a sudden instead of going is it, open theism biblical he was trying to basically give everybody a lesson on calvinism and try and convert us there in the middle of the sanctuary yeah that was funny will duffy could have done better in calling him out on that the mass Slick wanted to change both the debates to be be about predestination and if you're a non-calvinist and you deal with calvinists on any regularity that's what they want to talk about they want to talk about predestination they want to talk about election mm -hmm. they don't want to talk about the nature and attributes of a god because if you watch matt slick his opening round in the first debate he doesn't quote the bible he doesn't rely on the bible the bible doesn't support these uh, platonic metaphysics and he d he will try to reject the label of platonic metaphysics but this is funny this is an interesting development as it turns out he knows nothing about who plato was what plato taught and the neoplatonists such as plotinus what they taught he oh, doesn't yes. know he doesn't know yeah, that was funny. He thought Plato taught a mutable God that can change and grow. What? He thought God had free will. Like we had free through free will, in that sense too. Yeah, he he thought Plato taught that people have free will. Mm -hmm. Where? Nowhere. It's like Matt Slick. Just use Google. Just <laughs> Google it and see if that's valid at all. Or even in the in the sense where, during the Q and A time, where Matt Slick, as you'll see. When you watch the debate, he keeps saying that open theism is like Mormonism and so forth and quoting it. And even at one point quoted a verse out of the Book of Mormon in order to throw Will Duffy off, which Will listened to it and said, this doesn't sound right. And says, no, I don't affirm that. I don't believe that. And Matt says, good, that was from the Book of Mormon. So Chris, using Matt's similar technique, goes through with some Greek philosophy text and reads them off to Matt Slick in which Matt affirms every statement is true. And then Chris says... I said, well, congratulations, you've just affirmed uh, Plotinus. You know? And then he sat down. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, you quoted uh, Pliny or something like that. No, it's the, the premier Neoplatonist. Mm -hmm. Do you not know anything about Neoplatonism? But that's funny. Joe Sabo, any thoughts? No, I actually think uh, in, in the terms of the debate, framing open theists as Mormons, as Matt Slick did, was a good move on his part. He's trying to frame the debate. And he keeps referencing over and over this affiliation between open theism and Mormonism. And this is my criticism of Will Duffy. Will Duffy did not frame the debate. And Will Duffy had the opening post, the opening uh, introduction to the first debate. He could have framed the debate. He could have said, you're going to hear a lot of things tonight. You're going to hear me quoting the scriptures. I will be talking about the Bible and how the Bible is, is taught, it describes how God is. And when you listen to Matt Slick, when he's talking, he's going to be referencing philosophy. So if Will Duffy would have primed the audience, that's one thing you need to do in debates is prime the audience. And say, watch for this, watch for this, watch for this. And as it comes up, you need to press down and press down and press down. And Matt Slick was doing that. When he heard something that reminded him of Mormonism, he would press it. And that, that's very effective on watchers. And watchers start forming the association in their mind. And they start saying, oh, see, he was right before because he said it here, he said there, he said there. And if Will Duffy, he doesn't cr crush that immediately, that association is going to form in their mind. So in debates, frame the debate. Exactly. So although Matt Slick is wrong, open theism is not Mormonism, it was a good debate strategy. He does understand how to talk to convince an audience. Matt Slick does. That goes to show his, as he expressed, his 25 years of debating the subject, speaking to Mormons, speaking to Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, he has actually done a lot of great work for the kingdom of God and, and, and bringing a lot of people in the, to the knowledge of the truth that Christ is king and he isn't and that they aren't part of some system where they are, we ourselves can become gods like Mormonism. And so I want to commend Matt Slick for what he does. And like Chris says, he, he was really good about forming a debate and pointing out specific things that he saw similarities in and being able to, to drive it. And whereas Will kind of lacked in that department. But overall, though, I thought Will did a good job. Yeah, so another uh, constructive criticism I would have for Will is he didn't press very hard when Matt Slick was evasive. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah, he did ask the same question over and over for clarification, but he didn't stop and pause and use his own time that he controlled to say, you're avoiding the question. 
And what you just described to me, what you just said is you, you're saying no to this question. Did God decree everything? You believe yes. You absolutely believe yes. You said yes. And we're going to move on to the next question. And But instead he led Matt Slick uh, pontificate. Well, yes and no, but what does decree mean? I don't know what decree means. I'm not going to define it for you. I'm just going to just whoosh, waste all your time talking about the meaning of words. And that's what he did. He, he stalled and stalled and stalled. The first debate was better with, when Will Duffy pressed and pressed and pressed, and it was this rapid-fire response. The second debate is where you kind of saw the lag in, in the pace of questions and the pace of forcing. And he didn't, he didn't definitively state what Matt Slick believes and move on to the next question, which would have been a lot more effective than letting Matt Slick just kind of jitter around on that. <laughs> Thoughts on the cross-examinations? Well, the first cross-examination in which Will was really pressing Matt Slick, like I said earlier, was was fantastic. He he got to admit that God was in time, that God had temporality. Um, at, at one point, he had a, a nice one, two, three punch that he set up for Matt, but basically, ultimately, that would lead to Matt affirming that open theism was true and then that is when the backpedaling started coming in and Matt Slick just started really reeling in that department and I thought that was really good because even the crowd as you'll hear in the debate was just kind of like oh was just I thought that was really telling in a lot of sense like that yeah so Duffy's Duffy's opening for the first debate that that's probably going to be the highlight of all these debates is his framing of open theism how, how he wants to establish the idea of open theism so Matt Slick was very intent on trying to frame open theism as open theists are only open theists because they want man's will to be supreme. He hallucinated motivations on the people. And I kept telling him over and over, me and all my friends, no one says that. No one says, the reason open theism is true is because I want man's will to be supreme. Yeah. It was specifically that the reason that we have free will, and Duffy really hit on this, was because God is free. And God can create... Um, a new butterfly. He can create a new song. He can create. He can create one more speck of sand, if he wants to. He could. He could have made. You know, God. Eve could have chosen another fruit on the tree than the one that was there, which is going to be a big, a big, a big issue in the debate. As, as I was bringing up here, that Matt Slick was saying that he, that God decreed the circumstances for Eve to pick the fruit. And, but then also said at the same time that Eve was capable of choosing another fruit, even though God had decreed from the foundations of the world that she would choose the fruit that she did in order to uh, initiate the fall. All right. So Will's idea was to frame open theism as it's about God's freedom rather than man's. It's, exactly. it's a good strategy, and it's one that disarms kind of what Slick's doing. But Slick's kind of in his own world. He, he thinks his own thoughts, and he doesn't care about what anyone else says. And so he kept, keeps pressing with this thing, you only believe this because I ascribe these hallucinogenic uh, false motivations to you. And that's a sure sign of cognitive dissonance. We talked about that in the Scott Adams podcast, that if someone ascribes to you imaginary motivations, it's, it, they, they're just hallucinating. It's, it, they can't deal with the substance of your arguments. And instead, they're trying to dismiss your claim or try to argue against something that you never said. Cognitive dissonance. And, and you see that all over in Slick. He, he was very slick in, in the debate. He kept moving around. You'd ask him a question, and he would like... And he, he couldn't be nailed down. And then, for example, the, the most interesting example, I think, was when Will Duffy kept trying to get him to to describe God's decree. What does it mean to decree this? What does it mean to decree that? What's the meaning of the word? And Slick's like, oh, I don't know. I can't define it. I don't want to talk about it. But then late in the debate, in the second debate, Matt Slick just uses the word like it's nothing. Yeah, like he's using the official Calvinist definition of it. He goes from being completely ignorant of what decree actually means in trying to jump around the question and use other words and what does that mean trying to say words have meaning to all of a sudden full-blown adhering to it and using it as if like everything he said before like he didn't and as other people were noticing and you will see matt slick talks out of both sides of his mouth during this debate consistently yeah we're gonna have to do a full breakdown of the matt slick portions at least but everyone if if you can't stand matt slick listen to number one most important thing, the first debate, Will Duffy's opening statement. Number two, Will Duffy's controlled cross-examination. 
those are the primary two things to listen to out of all these these both these debates. Yes. But we will talk about Matt Slick later. Well, let's talk about Will Duffy's uh, opening position in the first debate is the God of open theism, the God of the Bible. And he, he makes two very bold claims which Matt Slick never addresses. He doesn't talk about it. He doesn't try to refute them. The first claim is that predestination and foreknowledge are only for open theists. Because in Calvinism, in uh, you know traditional classical theism, God is timeless, outside of time, pure simplicity, and as Matt Slick reveals in the second debate, that he believes that God's knowledge is identical to his essence and originates only from inside himself. I wish Will Duffy would have explored that a little bit, how the knowledge that is ascribed to God in the Bible, God looks down from heaven and sees the ways of man. That, that's how God gains knowledge in the Bible. God tests, God sees, God uh, does. I'm going to do this and that's how I know it's going to happen. That, those are the methods of gaining knowledge described in the Bible. But to Matt Slick, God's knowledge is inherent and internal to himself, identical to his essence, because a gain of knowledge, if you receive knowledge passively, is a change to God, and Matt Slick can't have that. Yeah. He consistently was using phrases like, uh, in one sense, yes, and in one sense, no, or ontologically, yes, God could do this thing, or in his essence, no, once again, talking out both sides of his mouth and just making God sound completely confused yeah. with what he's even trying to decree or say, say himself. Yeah. So with this in mind, predestination and foreknowledge are only for open theists. Only open theists think that God could have knowledge previous to an event. Only open theists think God could declare and decide an event beforehand. Everything else, all these other systems, it's all eternal. It's all identical to his essence outside of time. All right, the next big point of Wills that we're going to touch on is the Incarnation. He points to the Incarnation as evidence for open theism, the Trinity, and Jesus' nature. When Jesus became a man, or when, when the second person of the Trinity became a man, was that a change in the Godhead? Yeah, um, I thought that he made some really good points there in that uh, when the second person of the Trinity took on flesh, there was a change in the Godhead, and that is something that has eternally changed the Godhead because Jesus remained a man even though he died and resurrected and now has a glorified resurrected body. That resurrected body is sitting at the right hand of the Father, the throne of glory right now. Yeah. To say that 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 Calvinists, the Calvin, the Calvinist like James White says, that God's eternal nature did not change in any way, shape, or form, but took on an action is a way of just avoiding the question altogether when in in Scripture, if as a Trinitarian we believe that, you know, Jesus is God in the flesh, that shows at the incarnation that God became a man and forever there was a change in the Godhead. Right, so Calvinists don't like this idea because they adhere to Platonic metaphysics. And uh, just a breakdown of Platonic metaphysics, there's three different hypostases. There's the absolute, perfectly simple, one, outside of time, God. There's, there's a realm in which the, of, the, of the intellect, which is unchanging and it's closer to the pure actuality. And then you got the physical world. And the physical world is where the mutable world is, where things change. So the material is part of this world. And so God can't be part of this world because that material world changes and changes introduces corruption into the Godhead. So the idea that Matt Slick presses with the, 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 the hypostatic union is that Jesus can't have a divine physical nature. Jesus has two natures, and there's the divine that does not change, that has all these attributes that are identical to his essence. And we, we already talked about what he believes about God being pure simplicity outside of time. He believes that was a part of Jesus, but the human part of Jesus was human. And it changed, and that was not part of the divine Godhead. And this is this is literally standard Christian hypostatic union theology. And so the question that I always ask these Calvinists is, was the human part of Jesus divine? And they will not answer the question. They'll say, oh, you don't understand the hypostatic union. I do understand the hypostatic union. That's why I'm asking this question, how I'm asking this question, because you don't want to answer this question. Exactly. It contradicts exactly what Paul writes in... In Colossians 2, that the fullness of the deity dwelled bodily, and they don't like that. They want this division between the material and the spiritual that uh, is that, that's not a concept in Israelite theology. That's a Platonistic concept that's imported onto the Bible. 
I think a really good point that uh, Will was pressing was that God wants his own prophecy to fail. Calvinists are dead set that all prophecy must occur, all prophecy must happen. Mm -hmm. But God in the Bible doesn't want that. In Jeremiah 18, he says, if a nation repents, you know, they're good or they're bad, and he, he want, curses them or blesses them, or, respectively, then if they change, he will revoke what he both said he'd do and what he thought he'd do. Because God doesn't want his prophecies to come to pass. Nineveh repents. Jonah's mad. Jonah's like, you should kill these guys. These are wicked, wicked people. And God's like, they repented. They don't know their left and right hand. God values people over prophecy. And that's like never responds to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember he uh, bringing up Jonah also uh, with, with the prophecy in Jonah where in 40 days Nineveh will be overturned. Um, and Will was really pointing out the, the, there that God was stating that he was going to perform an action. He was determined to destroy Nineveh for their wickedness and their mistreatment of the Israels, Israelites and that um, ultimately he was going to bring this about. But then the repentance comes and God relents of the destruction he's going to lay upon him. And, and to that, Matt would just simply respond, this is a figure of speech. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Let's talk real quick about Matt Slick, his debate style, and what, what kind of points he made. And do you think his opening uh, post, his opening statements for the first debate, do you think that was effective? Uh, no, I do not. Um, especially, um, I would say as he, he was framing the debate, which was a good thing about getting putting it into a format that people could kind of relate to, I guess, or understand where he was coming from. Um, but as, as we said earlier, he was forming in a sense, just that open theism has a lot of things in common with Mormonism. And there were, to be honest, I'm ignorant of some of the things that he was bringing up in that regard. And so a lot of it added more confusion than like, uh, what, where's he going with this? Cause I, I believe that I've actually read that there are some Mormons who actually are open theists in that regards too. And, uh, it just, it, it seemed to be, he was framing it, but I feel like he was framing it in a way to try and backhand everybody in the room it's it's a strategy called poisoning the well it's a, trying to negatively associate things with your opponents and he was doing it purposefully and he actually told me he's doing it purposely and when i brought up his affiliation with platonic doctrine number one he doesn't understand platonism he doesn't know who plato was he doesn't know what plato taught he doesn't know that plato taught an immutable god that he taught he didn't know who plotinus was neoplatonist extraordinary he knows nothing about platonism but I brought up all his similarities with Platonism, and he just started screaming. This is the second debate, and the day before and the after debate. That's not recorded. He started screaming, genetic fallacy, genetic fallacy. What the genetic fallacy is, what a fallacy is, is you got some sort of premise, you got some sort of inference, and then you have a conclusion. And if you have a false inference, uh, that would make your conclusion invalid. But I wasn't claiming that Calvinism was false because it's influenced by Platonism. I was saying... Calvinism is influenced by Platonism because Augustine in his writings said that the entire Bible is silly and so you have to read it in light of Plotinus, a Neoplatonist. And he said, basically he said, he said the only reason, the only use for the Bible is charity. The Jesus element was the only use for the Bible. All of his other theology he can get from Plotinus. So if that's not <laughs> proof positive that his theology was highly influenced by Platonist doctrine of Plotinus specifically, I don't know what is. It's not. It's not a fallacy of logic. It's a truth that's regularly acknowledged by scholars. But what he wants to do with Mormonism is just equate us to Mormonism. Even though no one I know who's an open theist is a Mormon, mm -hmm. no one I know says, "Oh, the Mormons have influenced me to be an open theist." Okay. He's just trying to poison the well. Mm -hmm, exactly. And like you said, his comment: God takes risks. God learns. God can sin, this is what Mormonism teaches, and that's the way he shaped his debate. And notice the emotional appeals. He says, oh, all these things I don't like, therefore they're false. And that, that was that's what he's going for. And then he accuses his opponents of making emotional appeals, yes. where his entire argument, everything he said, was all based on emotions. This is the way I want God to be, therefore God is that way. Mm -hmm. His entire opening post. Uh, look look to see if he references the Bible 
whatsoever. And every time he does reference the Bible, he does this thing where he shotguns proof texts, exactly. and he just assumes his own meaning. Exactly. That was one thing I, I noticed. His version of, of uh, reading scripture to you was quoting the plethora of one-liners that he had in his head, and he would shout them out without actually reading them or any contextualizing of it in any way, shape, or form, or he would paraphrase it in such a way that he was basically trying to proof text Calvinism based upon what he had memorized in his brain instead of actually going to the Bible and reading it in context, which will seem to be bringing it back to that point mm -hmm. in talking about the fuller meaning of the passages in order to argue open theism in the affirmative, whereas Matt Slick was trying really hard to point it to pigeonholes into colonist Mormons. Yeah. So, so Maslick does this thing where he, he kind of understands that words have contextual meaning. Only when it suits his side. Only when, you know, it, he could use it against us. But he'll deny anything, anyone else, else who's trying to use his proof at text and say there's uh, other meanings that could be attributed to those texts. Let's take, for example, a post-debate thing. I don't know if I told you about this instance. I was talking to Matt Slick, and he says, oh, God knows everything. First John uh, 3.20. First John 3.20, he says. And, you know, if, if you watched our previous podcast on the Slick pre-debate, I talk about this. And God knows all things. He just assumes his Platonist to metaphysics into that. And I said, well, man knows everything. First John 2.20. And he freaked out. He never heard of it in his life. I'm like, you must have read this verse like 10,000 times. And the fact that you don't know this verse, uh, that's problematic. And so what he does, he, he uses like the ESV. He goes there and it says, you all know these things. But I said, no, that's, that's not the majority text. It's not the Byzantine text. He freaks out. He's never heard this in his life. He runs to his computer and he's like this. Oh, this doesn't say that. This version doesn't say this. This version, I think he was checking English versions. And here's the thing. The only two versions of the Bible that use the majority or Byzantine text, Meslik doesn't know anything about textual criticism. He, he doesn't he doesn't know it. So he, he was I bet he was checking English translations. Mm -hmm. The only two versions that use the majority or Byzantine texts are the King James and the New King James, which use the same phrase uh, for all. You know all. It's not you all know. You know all. Just like it said of God. And this blew his mind. And he says, what does this mean? That man knows everything? Because that, that's what I said to mock him, actually. I was like, this means man, man knows everything. And he's like, no, no, it doesn't. Man doesn't know everything. I said, read the verse. Read the verse. Man knows everything. Man's omniscient. He's like, we know that's not true. And here's the point. And he didn't get it. It, it, didn't, it didn't cross his mind. His inconsistencies where he's forcing his theology on uh, 1 John 3.20. And he, he's just assuming away similar phrases in other contexts. His total hypocrisy, his total uh, neglect of, of textual criticism, his total neglect of contextual understanding of phrases, it didn't faze him. It, it caused this cognitive dissonance that was visible, and he was very frustrated. Yes. I, I, found, it, I found it really appalling, too, that uh, in prepping for this debate, Matt Slick was using verses such as Jeremiah 18 as, as, as proof texts. Uh, for Calvinism in the sense of the context of Romans 9. But during a debate when Will Duffy goes to press him for this, he all of a sudden is ignorant of it and has no idea it even exists in the Bible. Um, another thing in which Chris was speaking to Matt Slick uh, in post-debate again, um, Matt Slick made a comment of, you know, the, the in the Bible, God never changes his mind. And Chris says, give me a verse. Dead silence. All of a sudden he doesn't know anything. I yeah, said, so there's no verse where God says he changes his mind. And, and the only two verses that says God doesn't change his mind are both quotes by men. And one of them is the false prophet Balaam. And one of them is uh, in context of uh, Samuel saying that God's not going to repent of repenting. And, and, and Jason Troyer pointed out that those two verses are about God doesn't repent like a man. It is the point of those two verses. And so Matt Slick was dumbfounded. I, I, he said, oh, God doesn't change his mind. I said, give me one verse. Silence. Silence. He couldn't answer. Exodus 32. Oh, sorry. God changed his mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he changed his mind all over the, all over the Bible. And, and it's in narrative. Narrative in which you, if you take that as a figure of speech, the narrative falls apart. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that Will Duffy didn't press that point. He didn't pr press the point that narrative determines 
whether something's a figure of speech or not. And what Matt Slick did, and this was very wise of him and smart of him, he pointed to personifications in the Bible. There are personifications in the Bible where, you know, like the mountains will do something or the river will do something, the blood cries out in Genesis. Those are personifications. But it's not like if you pull those out of the text, the whole narrative falls apart. And they have meaning. And you're able to understand the meaning. The blood cries out means that, uh, you know, this is justice that's demanding some sort of action. But Matt's like, he, he avoided that. He avoided explaining his idioms, explaining the meanings of his anthropomorphisms that he's trying to dismiss in the Bible. I, if you listen around the three hour and eight minute mark of the first debate, I actually ask him the question, if God is living, loving, personal, relational, and good, um... Then, you know, texts such as Isaiah 5 with the uh, wine press and the grapes, the wild grapes, Genesis 6, Exodus 32, Genesis 22. Um, in your regard, if you think God's relational, then how are these turning into figures of speech and anthropomorphisms? Because that's the one thing he kept harping on, is that these were all figures of speech. They were all anthropomorphic. They were the way Calvin spoke of a wet nurse speaking to a child and whispering to them because we're incapable of understanding God speaking to us directly. And he just completely avoided the question by saying it has to do with my presuppositions and it has to do with hermeneutics, which he would love to teach me. He's so thoughtful. He's, so you know thoughtful. That. He's so, such a nice guy. He'll teach everyone everything. But here's well, another interesting that came out of this debate. Meslik doesn't know Greek. He doesn't no. know Greek. No. Nope. Okay, what he does is he has these uh, Bible programs that uh, with the tense voice moon on them. And so Will and him got in this debate about uh, Acts 13, 48. 48. Yes. Yeah, whether it's passive or middle. And, and Will, Will Duffy, he's not like a big Greek guy, but he actually knows the basics of of how that functions in that verse, the difference between middle and passive. Which in Greek, if you actually know Greek, uh, you know that the middle and passive are the same word. And you have to decide which one it is by context. And Matt Slick's software doesn't do that. It doesn't say it could be this one or it could be this one. It just puts a P there for passive. And because Matt Slick doesn't know Greek, and uh, he doesn't know how Greek grammar works, he, d he just relies on his Bible software. So he pretends he knows Greek. And when Will Duffy, and Will Duffy told me this, uh, you'll see it on the video, that uh, Will Duffy said this word could be middle or passive, and Matt Slick didn't know which word it was in context. Tetagomenoi, is that what it was? Yeah, he didn't know, he can't read Greek. But and, what is that again? What word is it in English? Yeah, what word is that in English? <laughs> because he has his English Bible, he can't read Greek. And what he wanted to do was click on it and see the little P, if it's a P or an M. But he doesn't understand Greek grammar. He can't read Greek. He can't read Greek. Yes. He, he doesn't understand Hebrew, too. I brought up the translation of the Proverbs verse about uh, God made everything, even the wicked for the day of destruction, which, you know, make could be like purpose. You know, the, it's a valid translation. And so uh, some translations translate it as God has a purpose for all things, even the wicked for the day of wrath, that God made a day of wrath to punish these wicked people. And that's the point of this proverb. Or else it, it means nothing. The proverb is proverb in Matt Slick's mind is saying everyone's fated to do everything. <laughs> is that a proverb? That's not a proverb. No, he was, that... he was using proverbs what sixteen a lot and, and just really just harping. And it was like his go-to verse um, on how to pull it up. I did not see it, but like he was just sitting there quoting like first of all poetry, mm. which is a means of just like instruction to his son and for that. But it it wasn't any intent and mean behind the text as a means of trying to teach like a theological subject about God, but more about a person's personal relationship with their son or distributing knowledge to someone as a way of living the proverbial life for yeah. perchance, which you see Job living said proverbial life in the text, and then yet he is uh, he gets wrecked. So if you're watching the second debate and you you get to the questions, and I ask something about verb conjugations, the point of that question is not about. Uh, you don't have to take anything from that about verbs and conjugating verbs and the difference between passive and middle. What you should take away from that, Matt Slick doesn't know Greek. And uh, he just assumes his interpretations on the verses without any knowledge of uh, translations and how translations work or operate. Mm -hmm. He was very, very fond of the NASB, uh, which we it is definitely needs an update because there's a lot of uh, new scholarship too that would refute a lot of things that he was trying to press using that translation in general like i mean especially the, i mean the acts 1348 thing was very telling in itself too where he's saying well it says here on my bible software that it's passive and then ultimately <laughs> will Duffy just said well you're wrong and it was just like next question 
And uh, yeah, and even after digging through there, just Will was in the right. There's a lot of different, it, there, the middle sense there for those, <laughs> instead of ordained to eternal life, dispose themselves to eternal life because the context before that and the past before it, the Pharisees reject uh, eternal life that uh, God had offered to them. Yeah, so in context, the middle is used elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so since context determines the meaning, if something's a middle or a passive, and a passive is you're being act on, so acted on. So if you're passive in a fight or something, people are picking on you. So passive, you're being act on, acted on. Middle, you're acting for yourself or on yourself. I'm brushing my teeth. It's, it's a middle. I'm doing something on myself. And so Maslick doesn't, you might understand the functions of these different voices, but he doesn't understand the Greek translation, how, how those Greek words are formed and how those Greek in, words indicate one from another. And that was the point of my question. So he didn't know Greek. He nope. didn't know Greek. Nope. And it was shocking. He didn't know what the Byzantine text was the previous day. Nope. Not whatsoever. So it's very telling that uh, you, you go into the debate uh, knowing that Matt Slick is very educated and he's very well versed in his apologetics. But we learned a lot also of the things that he is lacking and ignorant of that uh, really uh, hurt him, I believe, in the debate. Yeah. So we probably should be wrapping this up pretty quick. So let's talk a little bit about the second debate. And which debate do you think went better, the first or second? I feel like the first debate was really well. I enjoyed Will's opening statement and his cross-examination was really strong. I believe he was really strong in the second debate as well. Um, especially, it doesn't seem like it initially, during the cross-examination where he was being cross-examined by Matt... He was, Will was getting pummeled, and, and we love Will, but the way Matt was approaching things, Will was not prepared for it. That's why he was getting pummeled. But there were a couple instances there where Will just had a one-liner response, and just and just it looked like Matt Slick took a baseball to the teeth because he was in shock that Will stopped him in his tracks and was able to produce a coherent refutation of what Slick was saying. Yeah, so there, there's 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 good punches back. I, th I think he did take a beating in the second. As I said, someone uh, sent me a message. Oh, he's getting hammered here. An open theist, a friendly guy. The first debate, I got a message from a Calvinist saying, oh, Matt Slick won this, hands down. And so I'm like, what? what he about? didn't even reference the Bible. The, the point of the first debate was, is the God of open theism the God of the Bible? Matt Slick didn't talk about the Bible. Nope. Will, Will Duffy should have hammered this. He should have said over and over, this is a debate if God of open theism is the God of the Bible. Matt Slick didn't talk about the Bible. He talked about Greek philosophy. He didn't talk about the Bible. So he lost the debate. He wanted to talk about something else. But Will Duffy, he's a nice guy. He's, he's, he is kind of passive. Yes. He, he could be... Introvert. He could be assertive at points, and he was assertive at points. And you'll see that his emotions flare in the first debate, round one. I wish those emotions carried over to the cross-examination... I think he could have hit back a lot harder and disarmed Slick. Yes, I agree. Totally agree. And one thing that, uh, one other point of constructive criticism for Duffy is that he allowed Slick to change the debate to Slick's ideas. Mm -hmm. So if, if the debate's about is the God of Calvinism loving, he allowed Slick to turn the debate into did God predestine people. And because of this predestination, that shows that God is living. And because, or loving, excuse me, not living. Um, also, but he is living, loving, personal relation, one good. <laughs> but also with election and predestination, and basically just giving a lecture on Calvinism and trying to convert everybody in the room, like I said earlier, and, and Duffy really needed to shut that down. He needed to say, this is irrelevant to this debate. Uh, explain how predestination proves God is loving. And then he could have fought those premises and fought those battles that he'd be more prepared for rather than fighting these obscure readings of these obscure verses that mm -hmm. Matt Slick doesn't understand the cultural context yes. going on. And he just assumes his Platonism into those verses. And it seemed like, what, as you'll see also in the debate there, that a lot of Will's responses seemed to be more emotional based. Because, I mean, there were certain, certain instances where Matt Slick was talking about Tulip, for instance, and asking Duffy questions about it which seemed that Duff, that Will was not as uh, fluent in it or in understanding it and once again Matt Slick had to go and give everybody an education lesson on what Tulip was and, and go through there too so uh, I guess a little bit of critique there with Will but overall I think he did a, a, really, a really fantastic job uh, amidst the way things went in the second debate which I thought was a weaker debate. Yeah, it was. I think, I think Will Duffy should have really embraced the point of the second debate is the God of Calvinism loving? 
rather than does the Bible show that God predestines someone to something? That's not the point of the debate. Will Duffy should have went full emotions. Okay, let's let's presume that your reading of that verse is true. What's your point? And then he could fight that point mm -hmm. instead of debating the meaning of those verses. That's not what the debate was about. And Will Duffy set it up to be an emotional debate, but then he didn't he didn't double down on it. He didn't take it. Mm -hmm. Again, all of this stuff is hindsight, 2020. We weren't the debaters, we weren't the ones up there. And so it's constructive criticism. And he did a really fine job. <clears throat> he 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 controlled himself in spite of all this abuse that Slick hurled. Slick would keep saying, oh, I'll go teach you this later. I'll teach you that. Oh, you don't understand. Very he condescending. Was, very condescending. And that's what he does. He tries to set himself up as an authority figure. And that's why it's good for videos to mock Matt Slick and his lack of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Again, he doesn't know who Plato was. He didn't know what Plato taught. He doesn't know what Platonism is. He didn't know who Plotinus was. He doesn't understand what the Byzantine text is. He doesn't understand Greek at all. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that different English versions of the Bible will give... Him all the answers he needs. Yeah, you know, like clicking on different versions of the Bible to see what how they translate this. Or he, doesn't, he doesn't know... I asked him, I said... He said, all these versions say this. I'm like, what Greek manuscripts are you reading? He didn't answer. Because he wasn't. He, he was clicking on the English versions. He's checking different English versions of the verse. That was very amateur. Oh, it's so funny. Very amateur. It was so funny. I'm like, seriously, dude? This is your life passion, and you, you don't know anything about Greek. Yeah. <laughs> and It was sad. It was telling. Yes. It, it was, yes, very much so. And relying on the English translations was definitely uh, a downfall, I believe, for uh, Slick Duranus, because it seemed like the open theists were hitting him with more Greek and more Hebrew and stuff like that, and he didn't know what to do with it, because he had to go to English translations in order to figure out what it meant, so it's like, okay, so much uh, for that. So, that's funny. I, I don't know if he'll take that to heart, or if he'll internalize it, and then and then take criticism back and, and you know, research his verses. He probably won't. Uh, he, he tends to view, view the world through a lens. And uh, he has this, this thought process that he goes through where only his view of the world is right. So he doesn't care about what his opponent believes. He doesn't care about accurately understanding and representing his opponent. He just wants to force his own views. Mm -hmm. And so he, there's times in the debate where Will Duffy says, oh, this is what this verse means. And what, Slick just couldn't comprehend it. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you just don't understand all these things. And I got this filter that works for me. Matt Slick, try to understand what other people believe. Mm -hmm. You can't be so focused on your own thing that you just discount other people's views. Mm -hmm. if, the, if, the, if, the, if someone quotes the Bible and it's not the way you quote it in your system that you are married to that will distort those texts and rip them out of their context. For instance, when he was hitting well with John 6, 6 65, John 6 or 65 and not hitting the context of verses 45 where individuals are rejecting the message and the truth that Jesus is presenting to them as as a reference from Isaiah 54, 13, um, talking to Israel specifically there and leading up into, you know, 665, he completely missed the context of it, was using a proof text for just the verse itself as a means of showing election and then trying to steamroll Will Duffy's interpretation of it. And that that that, that showed uh, a lot of character of how Matt Slick is working through a system and that's his filter and his presupposition through there in order to make it all fit into the five points to love. Yeah, you watch what he does. He says, I could use analogies. You can't use analogies. Yeah. I could explain the answers to my questions. I'll cut you off because before you can explain your answers to those questions. Or, hey, Matt, can you give me an analogy of that? Oh, I don't want to use an analogy. I'm going to use the Bible. But then he will use analogies consistently in the debate. And it's yeah. just like it's talking out of both sides of the mouth. Complete Double standard. inconsistent person. And he, it's, it's anything that benefits him, he'll accept. And he, he won't allow that on his opponents. And, and we've noticed this. In our previous discussions, podcasts on Matt Slick, he's arrogant. He's full of himself. Uh, he, he's very condescending, and he wants to make his opponents lick his boots like he's some sort of theology god. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's the only way he's going to engage in people. Because if people treat him just with even just Arthur Hagland, just treating him with the factual, uh, straight type of tones, factual confidence statements, he'll take, oh, you're, you're insulting me. I'm, I'm so, oh, you're not being Christian. Oh, you, you need to like worship me like a pastor, and then mm -hmm. I'll talk to you. And then he'll shift that. He did that in the morale debate as well. Mm -hmm. He didn't do that quite in these this debate. We complain about the lights a lot. Well, that 
I do think he has a problem there, and he always says he has like Asperger's or something, and that might be true. He's so focused on his own views, and no one else's. He doesn't care what anyone else says. He might have some sort of mental thing going on okay. there. Yep. The interesting thing is this guy has a following. He's got a following, and people think that he's like smart and intelligent. But you're not smart and intelligent if you don't consider and understand other people's views. Yep. He that knows only his own side knows little. Yeah. I, I remember specifically making the comment that based upon the uh, assertions he was making about us and the conclusions he was coming to, that he was going to go update karm.org under the open theist section. As, as a, I think he was talking he was going to relate a lot of things towards Mormonism and just <laughs> completely underhand open theism because he's not there to understand and to learn. He will refuse to be taught in any way, shape, or form. That'll just completely offend him in every way, shape, and form. And uh, he's just he's just there to collect information and to smear everybody if he doesn't uh, agree with his theology, even though... By the end of the debate, we were all pretty sure he was an inconsistent okay. Armenian. I do got to give him props. He comes to hostile audiences. Uh, this was a completely hostile audience. Oh, yeah. In the first debate, there was a very irate individual who got up and uh, kind of just kind of screamed at him. Uh, there were yes. combative questioners who wanted to debate from the question stand. That's a yeah. bad practice. If, you, if you're asking questions, make sure your questions are small, concise, and something that uh, you don't have to have like a back and forth dialogue on. Yes. That's, that's, those are tips for good questioners. So Matt Slick, he came to a hostile audience. He flew out for a hostile debate, a debate that, uh, you know, he, he's, he's gracious in that sense. And uh, you do have to give him props. And he is a nice guy and per person, even though he calls you a heretic and you worship a different god and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, but if anyone says Calvinists are, are not uh, brothers, he'll get all mad. And mm -hmm. I don't know. But he, he's a nice guy, but I will still make fun of him. I'll still mock him. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I got previous podcasts doing that because of he, he is just so arrogant, condescending, and oblivious to anyone else except for himself. Exactly. That was very apparent throughout the rest of the debate. What do you think, Great. Joe? Closing comments, Joe Sabo. All right. All right. So uh, thank you for joining t me today, Nathan Pleasure. Patterson. You got it right this time? Yeah. Robert Patterson's younger brother. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he actually has a good movie called The Rover. Oh, I never heard of it. It's it's a post-apocalyptic one with uh, Patterson. He's a good actor, actually. Right. So go out, watch The Rover is what, if you get anything <laughs> from this podcast. Yeah. All right. I'm Nate Patterson. I'm Chris Fisher. This has got it open. Got us open. <laughs> Got questions, comments, send it to God is open questions at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.